<laughs> God bless you, big cousin Stan. Good to see, good, to, good to see y'all. Thank you for the devotion, Reverend Stanley. Good to see those of you on the Zoom line, and grateful to have those of you on the prayer line. I am grateful tonight to be on for one more moment of living in expectation. I'm grateful tonight for the Word of God as we have been studying in the Book of Acts. Uh, I always do this re this review each night, uh, just in case somebody new turns on. We are in the book of Acts, where the, the, the birth of the church, the growth of the church, the strength of the church, the opposition to the church, and the victory of the church uh, in opposition is revealed. And I want us to understand that what, what we see in the book of Acts is very available. It is available for those of us in the body of Christ today, in our individual lives and in our church lives. I want to be very clear about that. Nothing that we see was then, is now as well. Nothing that we have seen is limited to a time, space, continuum. It's not... Oh, that just happened in the early church. That just happened um, in Jerusalem. No, God's power, God's Holy Spirit uh, moves in such a way that everyone, everyone who knows him, everyone who uh, has a relationship with him can experience his great power in our lives. We have gone through six chapters all together. We are now in the seventh chapter. In the seventh chapter, what we're seeing, uh, again, is the manifestation of God's power in a man named Stephen. Uh, Stephen was a deacon that was called um, by, and, and I want to say this in the correct way, the apostle was called by God, and God then encouraged the congregation um, by his guidance to select these men, these deacons. And so these deacons now, uh, again, um, have a responsibility, but not one responsibility. They have a responsibility primary to, to, to minister to the congregation, but as well. Their responsibilities uh, are in to, to expound and share the gospel as well. So in other words, they're not just to do what we call administrative stuff. That was their reason for existence, but they were not limited in their, in their initial purpose from preaching. And we see this here uh, in the book of um, Acts with this man, Stephen. The Bible says very clearly that Stephen was preaching. Uh, his preaching, for whatever reason, well, I shouldn't say that, his preaching uh, created uh, energy. His, his preaching created hostility against him uh, as a result of him preaching about Jesus Christ. And that's what happened. And so as a result of that, uh, they brought him before the council. The same council, if you remember, that sought to prosecute and persecute uh, Peter and John and other disciples. Now, uh, they have decided now to bring uh, Peter, I'm sorry, uh, Stephen before this Sanhedrin council. And I got to go back to chapter seven, verse one, to really contextualize this. Chapter seven, verse one gives us the response. Once they have collected Peter, once they've arrested him and taken him for the Sanhedrin council, the high priest asked him this question, are these charges true? Is it true that you blaspheme against God? Is it true uh, that you have spoken negatively in regard to God? Is it true that you uh, put Christianity for Judaism? And, and, and Stephen then went on, I love to imagine this. Peter, I'm sorry, Stephen went on a revivalistic tangent. Stephen began to share the history of Israel beginning at the very beginning. He would, last night he began with Abraham. He moved from Abraham to Moses. And now today as we pick up, he is in the life of Moses uh, sharing what happened. Now, I, I've been tempted, I must admit, Reverend Edwards, I've been tempted to say, well, you know, I skip over this and get to the end, but I can't because in each of these verses that we find a level of truth that can speak to any situation in any circumstance in our lives. In other words, last night, I didn't understand when I started the class how um, the, talking about patri the patriarchs and Joseph are going to be a benefit to us today. But I realized, again, what it demonstrates is no matter what the situation or circumstance, what we learned is that despite the fact that Joseph had been abandoned, actually betrayed by his brothers, what we find out is the Bible says God was with him. God showed favor toward him. God gave him wisdom and God delivered him. And so it reminds us again that no matter what anybody does to us, as we trust God, God is able to do those same things in our lives. We picked up with Moses last night and we realized that Moses was facing, even at his birth, um, what do they call this? That's what they call when they're trying to genocide. Moses at his birth was facing genocide. There was a plan by the Egyptian pharaoh to kill all males. Uh, and, and it was genocide. That's what their whole purpose was to make sure that there was no more growth, there was no more proliferation of the Hebrew people. Why? Well, because the Hebrew people came to Egypt with 75 people and God blessed them to have become a nation within a nation. Let me pause parenthetically and share this. 
our black men today, I got to say it, and quite frankly, our black women as well are facing genocide, governmental, organized, subtle, uh, de facto genocide, seeing how many different ways can we minimize, marginalize, even destroy young black men and young black women. There it is, okay, I put it on the table and now it's been recorded so it can be shared. Here's the reality, the same way that God delivered Israel despite Egypt's deliberate efforts to destroy the male in Egypt. The way God delivered them is the same way God would deliver us. Now, let me pause. I said this last week at the funeral. I said it to y'all before. What can't deliver us is the courts. The courts, I was in the Bob shop today and everybody was having this conversation about court system, court system. I had to sit up when they finished cutting my hands and listen, here's the thing. The court system wasn't designed to save and deliver. The court, is, the court system in America was designed to oppress. Let's just start off with that. Now, I'm not saying we don't need courts. I'm saying, but it's designed. So for all those of us who think, oh, the courts can save us, the courts can't. I was in a, at a, a, a situation for work not too long ago, and a mother said, the courts is sitting my son to more time in jail. He would have never died. And I said, now, the point was totally missed. It wasn't the court's fault because the court can't save your kid. Therefore, the court can't destroy your kid. It comes back to the reality of the personal responsibility of each Christian to do what? To share Christ with our family, our friends. So instead of us standing and, and, and protesting, saying the courts messed us up, let us recognize that the responsibility goes to us. I'm gonna take a step further. Instead of the church standing and saying, why well, the government ain't doing this? The church has to point in and say, what can we do to be an instrument that God can save our men and our, our boys and our girls? Somebody said, well, legislation, the, the White House, the, the, the Congress, the State House, the City Council, the County Committee, School Board, I, none of that can do it. They can do policies. They can be beneficial. But lives can't be transformed in those areas. The only way life can be transformed is through our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Point blank, period. I said this last week. I, you, can, you can make all the gun laws in the world, but if somebody wants to shoot somebody, they're going to shoot somebody. They're going to find a gun somewhere. And uh, if they can't shoot their stab, they won't stab their beat, whatever. Violence is in the heart of man, and the only way violence is evicted from the heart of man is as a result of a person having a relationship with God through Christ. I want to say that right there. So when we looked at our verse last night, what I came to understand was that the biggest issue is that some we as Christians have sometimes ceded authority or ceded, uh, ceded our position for, of transformative power to the, somebody else. We said it's somebody else's job, but it's not. It's ours. So let me pick up tonight, having said all that. Um, just, just demonstrate, show this in verse 20, Moses was born um, and he was born and he was cared for in his father's house, but God, by his divine plan, took a boy, Moses, who was supposed to be put to death at birth and instead promoted him, moved him, elevated him to a place where he sat in the house and grew up in the house of the man who had a death warrant against him. Y'all hear me? Moses was born in the house, lived rather, in the house of Pharaoh. All right. He was born uh, in, 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 in the, the tenements of where the Hebrews lived in Egypt. So he wasn't born in the middle class area. He was born in the tenements, the slums, you might say. But God created a situation where his mother placed him in a, in a, in a, on a river and the river took him down and he ended up growing up in Pharaoh's house. The man who had given the Eden to kill all male children. Who could have done that but God? Nobody. Nobody could have done that but God. So now we got this boy Moses. He's growing up, and the Bible says he's educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. He was a special, special person. I say this again. Sometimes we're tempted, and I say we because I've been there before to look at somebody and say, I don't know if they're going to make it. I've come to learn that it's not our job or we're not capable or, or talented enough to see who's not going to make it. As a church, our job is not try to figure out who we're going to work with and who we're not going to work with. Our job is to offer Christ and work with whoever God sends us. Can I say that? All right, I said that right now. Okay, now here we are, verse 23. When Moses was 40 years old, so for, for 30, I'm sorry, for 39 years and six months, he lived in Pharaoh's house. But at 40 years old, he decided to visit, visit his fellow Israelites. In other words, he knew that he was an Israelite. Pharaoh knew that he was an Israelite. Yet here he is, having grown up in Pharaoh's house, and when he gets 40 years old, he decided to visit his brother Israelites. The Bible says in verse 24 that he saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. 
So he went to his defense and avenged his brother Israelite, who he didn't know personally, but he knew that he was connected to the Israelites. He killed the Egyptian. Moses then thought that his own people would realize that God was using him. Verse 25 says, Moses thought that his own people realized that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. So let me, let me pause and give you a, a 2023 narrative of that. Moses thought that he would be made a hero because he defended his brother, but that's not what happened. That's not what happened. How do you know that? Look at verse 26. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting, and he tried to bro broker the peace, to reconcile them by saying, me and your brothers, what do you want to hurt each other for? But one of the men, verse 27, said, the man who was mistreating other pushed Moses aside and said, who made you rule and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Let me stop here. Moses felt at this point his calling. His calling, even at this moment, was to be a deliverer for Israel, appointed and called by God. But guess who didn't see it at first? The people that he was sent to deliver. And be and, and rescue from the bondage of Egypt. They did not recognize it because you saw what happened. He tried to help somebody else out. They called him a murderer. I, I, I find that fascinating. And I, I, especially as I look at the world today, and even as I'm talking, the Lord has revealed to me this is reality. Sometimes it's most difficult for those that God has sent us to serve to get accolades from them because they look at us perhaps as not who we think we are called to be. Last week, I tell you the truth, when I was there at the funeral last week, I just thought for sure that 1,500 people are going to come to Christ just that I preached the word of God. But I realized that it's a little more nuanced than that, that sometimes the people don't see, and I'm not talking about Eric Thomas, I'm talking about the body of Christ. We don't see, and the world doesn't see, and in our, in our case, the people that we are sent to serve don't necessarily see us for who God has sent us to be. That doesn't mean we give up. That means we realize the challenge is not that they're not listening. It's just that the time has not come for them to see, but we still are required to do what we call to do. People live on Venetian and Sandtown, live on Camelton, live in Oakland City, they live on um, um, Lockwood, Graymont, Westmont, they live on Anna Walker, they live on all those streets. And we've been there for a long time, ministry. And I used to get frustrated when I would say, people walk by the church every day and they don't come here to receive Jesus. But I've come to understand that it's not our time to call when to do it. We just got to keep doing what we are called to do. And in that season in which God softens the hearts of those whom we've been in the midst of for, I'm talking about 56, 46 years, it's important for us to understand that when that season comes, guess what? God is going to move. All right? Y'all got me? So let's not grow weary in well-doing. Let's keep doing what we've been doing. And let's keep being excited about what God is going to do in his season. Now, let me get back to this text. I drifted off because the Lord took me there. So I'm, I'm back to the text. But I got to go wherever the Lord sent me. Okay, here we go. They, 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 they told him that you killed that man and you're going to kill me too. Moses, verse 29, was afraid because when he heard this, he fled to Midian where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. He went to Midian primarily because he was afraid that everybody knew that he had killed the Egyptian. And he was afraid that he would have to have, hold, have an account for that. So he was on the lamb. He was a, 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 a fugitive, if you would. Even though no court had come against him, nobody had voted against him, nobody, no judicial system had charged him, he ran and moved to Midian. And in, in Midian, he lived as a foreigner and he had two sons. He had a family. Now, at 40 years old is when he had this episode. Verse 30 says, 40 years later, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. And when he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to look more closely, he heard the Lord's voice. I love this. What did the Lord say? The Lord said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. And then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and have come down to see set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. I'm going to stop here tonight, I believe, for a moment. But what I want us to look at this verse and understand is this, again, is demonstrative of the magnificent sovereignty and the power of God. The people thought that God didn't hear their cries under the oppression. But guess what? God heard them. Sometimes we feel as if God doesn't hear us and not, as, not aware of our circumstances. But I stopped by here on the expectation moment on this Saturday night to say he does. And as we trust him, 
God has everything lined up as we trust him to bring us out of whatever our situation is. Can I say that? Y'all understand? Believe me. Y'all believe the Lord can do that? That's what the Lord is able to do. As we trust him, God is already lining up the way out. God was lining up the way out for Egypt. I mean, for, 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 for Israelites out of Egypt. He already lined it up. And so all Moses was doing was showing up at a divinely appointed place to do that which God had divinely appointed him to do. I'm going to say this. I'm closing. This is why we must look at each day with expectation. This is why we must end every day with the, with the, with the mindset of this day the Lord has made. I rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because we never know where God is going to take us that day. And we never know what God is going to do within, the, within that day. This right here is an example of how we must live. We must live ready to go wherever God says go. We have an encounter with God. We can't say, now it's not the time. We got to just have that encounter and then follow God's instructions. I'm going to do this last part. God told him to go back. He said, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. And then verse 35, he said, this is the same Moses whom they had rejected with, with the words, who, who made you rule and judge. In other words, Moses had to consider why he left. He left because he thought he was in trouble. But yet here is God um, telling him to go back. He, he, he repeated the words that had been said and was reminded by the angel who appeared to him that uh, what his work would to be, was to be. Here's the thing I want to be clear about. As Stephen told his story, he was sharing this chronologically to the Sanhedrin council. So they would see the hand of God in everything. Some of them looked at history like it was just that. It was history. Stephen and the Christians must look at history as God's divine appointments to accomplish God's divine work. The reason why this is significant, and we're going to see this in a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and give y'all the next episode, is that they had an issue with Jesus. He was preaching ultimately about Jesus, and he would close out with Jesus. But he wanted them to understand, you saw how God moved before. Look how he used Jesus, and look where you are now. Open up your hearts. And, and this is my message to most people all the time I get a chance. You can close your heart and miss out on God. You can open your heart and have a transformed life. And so I'm saying that to you all so that we can share that with others. When other people come to us and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Hey, open your heart. Just like when I make the appeal some Sundays. Try Jesus. Try. Give him, give him a try and watch what would happen. All of us came to Christ not with, without the full knowledge of what would happen. But we tried him. And here we are. Look what God has done. So I'm going to pause there tonight, but I cannot help but to interweave the message of Stephen at the time with the message content that Stephen was talking about on how this actually is real and how it impacts our lives as we trust God. I'm going to stop tonight at about 720, maybe 722. But I pray this I will come back next year. It's going to take me a few minutes to get to the end of this section. But it's significant because in this significant section, we're, we're learning the blueprint of God's movement. And we're learning and seeing the manifestation of God's power, which gives us the ability to look ahead, not with blinders on or not looking ahead in darkness, but looking ahead with the bright, shining expectation of what God would do in our lives. I thank God for each of you. I so hope tomorrow y'all come to church because we have a church tomorrow. I don't know if y'all do that. It's, it's, it's second Sunday, and we're going to have a good time in the Lord tomorrow, and I pray that if those of you who can come will just come on. Don't come first, sec, first and third, or second, fourth. We're not a fourth, two Sunday month church. We have church every, every Sunday. God has brought us through a pandemic. Let us not make any excuses. Let's come tomorrow so that we can fellowship, worship together. I thank God for you, and I pray that God will bless each of you richly tonight as a result of tuning in on this moment of expectation. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, again, it's once again, we say thank you for all of your rich blessings and all of your magnificent power that you exhibit in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for every man, woman, and boy, or girl who's tuned in tonight on Expectation Moment. I thank you, Lord, on the, on the for those on the phone line, those on the Zoom line. I pray, God, tonight this word would resound in our hearts again and just give us, begin to build up again our expectation, build it beyond its, bar its boundaries before, that we may see your hand operating in our lives individually as well as the body of Christ. God, I pray that you bless every household, every individual believer, and every uh, family that's represented tonight here on Expectation Moment. I pray, God, that you let your word get in our hands and feet that would better equip us to serve you and, and, and go out and, 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 and be sent to find others and tell them about you. I pray, God, that you let your word get in our hearts 
that we may, that we may be strengthened in our inner person. God, let your word get uh, in our ears that we can hear your word over the winds and the waves of the world. God, let your word get on our minds, in our minds. We might have peace that surpasses all understanding and that the fiery darts of Satan will be quenched. God, let your word get on our lips, tongues, vocal, lungs, and throat that we as Christians may uh, declare your word to each other, to a dying world, and to ourselves. God, I pray that you give us peace and joy, grace and mercy. God, again, I pray that you build a hedge of protection around us that the fire dogs and Satan be quenched. God, then I pray that you would give us the ability to do three things. Pray without ceasing, give you thanks in all things, knowing this is your will for those of us in Christ Jesus. And finally, Lord, that we may rejoice in you. God, Lord, let us not quench the Holy Spirit, but Lord, let us be guided and empowered by your Holy Spirit. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hold on, Zoom line.